Good morning once again. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning, Hebrews chapter 11 is where we're going to begin. I do love my God today and I do love him and thank him for when he, as you discussed in Sunday school, when he works behind the scenes. I told you last week, no matter what's going on in your life, I can tell you one thing for sure, and that's God's working in your life today. You may not see it and you may not uh, understand, but I promise you he is working. And uh, I had to kind of sit back there as usual and just smile as I heard the Sunday school lesson and Sister Frankie uh, she uh, went hand in hand with what we're going to talk about. And no better story could have been talked about than Moses this morning. And we'll touch on that a little bit more here in a minute, but well, you may have heard this story before, but I want to share it with you because it goes hand in hand with the message today. There was a boy who went to college to wait on his sister. He was about 13, and he was sitting outside her classroom. It was a beautiful day like this, and he was sitting out on a bench reading his Bible and learning about God. And uh, as you know, sometimes you just open that Bible and you begin to read and you begin to feel better. Well, he was reading the story of Moses parting the Red Sea, and he began to rejoice, and he began to realize that he served a God that's greater than any problem this world has to offer. So he was sitting there with a smile on his face and his hand extended to God, praising God when one of the professors walked by, and he saw the young boy reading the Bible, and uh, he thought, you know what, now is a good time as any to let him know the truth about the world and the Bible and what a fable he's reading. So he stopped and he said, son, why are you so happy? What, what are you uh, celebrating there? And he said, well, I just realized that I serve a God that's so powerful that he parted the Red Sea so the children of Israel could cross through for safety. And he said, well, son, that's very easily explained with science. He said, where he parted the sea was only 10 inches deep. And he smiled with sadistic glee as he thought, well, I've led this young man back to the light of truth. And as he began to walk away, the young man sat there silent for a minute, and then he began rejoicing again and praising God. And, this, and the professor turned around and said, what are you praising God for now? And he goes, I'm praising God that he's a mighty God because he just, I just realized he just drowned the entire Egyptian army in 10 inches of water. <laughs> <laughs> that young man's faith was strong, would you say? Would you say that the world tries to change our faith in God. They try to tell us he's not real. They try to tell us it's a fairy tale. And they try to tell us, they'll try to use science. <laughs> oh, if they only knew who invented science. <laughs> but they try, to tell, they try to explain things away. Folks, have you ever had an experience in your life where you just can't explain it away? Amen. I can't explain to you why Jesus Christ loved me so much that he come and died on a cross for me so that my sins could be forgiven. I, don't, I can't explain that. But I stand here today in front of you with every ounce of me and every, every breath I take, I believe that. And I will stand on that. But you see how strong that young man's faith, it was strong. How strong is your faith this morning? Can it be moved? Can it be changed? What is faith? How do we know if we have it? Well, no, beautiful, no more beautiful picture could have been painted than this morning when Moses' mother took him to the river. Now, I'm going to ask you mothers this morning. Can you imagine for one second putting your infant in a little handmade basket and just pushing him out to the river? What's the one word? that you must have, it must indwell you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet to take your child and shove him into the river. Faith. Hmm. You studied this morning and you saw how God rewarded her faith. Now, I'm not going to ask you men how many of you, if you knew, you could cast your child out into a basket into the river and that soon it'd be brought back to you and they'd pay you to raise it. 
how many of you would be casting them out there? That's a pretty good deal, wasn't it? Not only did Mama get her baby back, but they paid her to raise it. Well, isn't our God good? Our God is amazing, and he can, you know, and before we get into the scripture, I'll, I'll just share this because this has been on my heart because I saw it this week, and, and somebody in the church had given me a list earlier in the week about preachers they like to listen to and, and which ones were good and which ones were bad. I hate to stand up here this morning and tell you, did you know there's preachers out there teaching false teaching? There is false teachers out there, false preachers, and and they attack. And I just found this really unique this week because I saw it, and they're they're attacking and twisting a verse that I've shared with you. I know for three weeks straight because God just has really lit me up with this verse, and it's you know it's in Romans, and I've shared it with you. Uh, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. They are twisting that into everything's going to be good. That is not at all what that says. First of all, who does that verse address? It addresses the children of God because it says those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Who loves God? Children of God. And how do you know if you love God? His, his, he says, if you love me, you will obey my word, right? So if you're living for God, that's who that verse is for, first of all. It's not for the world. It's not for the lost. God does not work all things good to them. But now see, good. <clears throat> How many, and I'm, I'm going to kind of give you the example and, and fix their mess up. How many of you ever prayed for something and didn't get it? Amen. How many of you ever prayed for a loved one, but they passed away anyway? Now, see, the world's trying to take that and say that it's not true. Folks, did you realize, number one, if you were praying for your relative to be healed and they knew God and they died, it could not be any better for them. They're in heaven. Why would we want to keep somebody down here when they could be home with Jesus? We have to correct the way we think. But all things work together for good to those who love God. Okay, that doesn't mean immediately. Amen? God is not Burger King. You don't have it your way. Sometimes, sometimes things happen that we don't like, but it's for our own best interest. Amen? How many of you have ever had to discipline your children and they thought, you know, they didn't like it because you wouldn't let them go somewhere or do something, but you knew it was for their best interest? Amen? That if they went, they could get hurt. Folks, it makes me mad to see people preach and teach the Word of God in the wrong way. I'm here to be really brutally honest with you this morning. If you're a child of God, life is not going to be great for you. It's not going to be a bed of roses. You'll have good days and you'll have bad days. You'll have troubles, you'll have trials, but you'll have blessings. But listen to me. The thing that you have that the world don't have is the knowledge of who you serve and where you're going. Amen? I tell you all the time, Christians still have flat tires. <laughs> That's the best way I know how to tell you. But God will help you change it. Amen? How would you like to go through this world that we live in today with the government we have today without God? It'd scare me to death, amen? They talk about inflation. They talk about all these things. And folks, those are very real issues. But you know what's worse than inflation? It's people dying in this world without Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to ask you this morning two questions. Can your faith be moved? And what do you consider faith? If you would, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 1. And you find that to this morning. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Hebrews 11 and 1, we're going to start. Hebrews 11 1 is probably one of the most uh, well-known verses in the Bible. But we're going to go deeper. We're going to read several more. 
Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith... Abel offered unto God a more, more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God." But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this beautiful day. We thank you today for the wonderful Sunday school lesson and the messenger you sent it to us through. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful songs that were sung. And God, now it comes the preaching of your word. And Lord, I just pray, dear Holy Spirit, rise up in me this morning and take total control of my thoughts, my words, and speak through me today, Lord, the, the words that you would have spoken. And I pray that you rise up in each one listening this morning and take control and open our ears, God, and our hearts. Help us to hear and receive your word. Build us and make us stronger, God. Help lead us closer to you. And in Jesus' precious name, as children all prayed. Amen. Amen. A couple of things I want to point out in this scripture. Number one, I ask you, how strong is your faith and what is faith? Let's, let's answer those in reverse. What is faith? It's very clear here. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. How many of you this morning are hoping to go to heaven? Amen. How many of you have seen heaven? Kind of glad nobody answered. We're going to have to have a visit. And this makes, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm not saying that at all. I, I believe if God so chose, he might reveal heaven to somebody one day. He did to John. John got to see it. He got to see it coming down. But here's the thing. Listen to what it's saying. Faith, and I want you to think this morning about Moses' mama. That just played in so well. I'm glad y'all were on that this morning. Think about her casting that baby into the river. Was she hoping that baby would be okay? She sure was. And when the evidence of not seen, she didn't know. She may have had hopes, but she didn't know what was going to happen. Now, see, we, we write that off because we've heard the story. We know that Pharaoh's daughter was going to go down there that day and bathe. We know because we've heard it. We knew Moses' sister, Miriam, would see Moses in that see it and then go over there and say hey won't you let you know mom take care of it or whatever we know the story please realize mama didn't know the story when she cast the baby into the river mama didn't know what was going to happen but she was hoping and she believed that because the evidence in her life of things that she had not seen before but God had taken care of them you remember what sister Frankie taught you this morning about the midwives you know, the order went out to kill all the babies, but the midwives found grace in God, and they wouldn't do it. So, I know this morning, I haven't spoken to you, but I know this morning some of you are praying for things, and you're wanting an answer, and you're not feeling like you're getting an answer. <laughs> or maybe you're like me, and you're a little bit like Gideon, and you want three signs. Maybe he gives you one, maybe he gives you two. You think it takes patience to wait on the third one? You think God will answer us? You think God answers us sometimes without giving us three signs? Amen. So, this is a trick question, but just go along with me. How many of you have seen God face to face? Can I tell you you're all wrong? Look around the room. 
Who are we? We are children of God. Amen? We are made in whose image? At God's image. Now, once you get saved, think about this. Once you get saved and you give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ and you're living for him, who do you think you're representing? God. How many of you have ever been helped by somebody you didn't even know? You've been in a situation, you've been in a bind, and somebody you didn't even know helped you. Or you've been in a situation, you've been in a bind, and a church helped you. Maybe this church helped you, or maybe a different church helped you. Who do you think that really is helping you? God. That's his children. You know, I love that song, and I, I couldn't even begin to tell you who the artist is. I don't know. But it says, you know, it says, with all these things, God, going on, why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't you helping? And he said, I did. I made you. Who are the hands and feet of God today? Raise your hand, church. It's you. It's me. Who, who's the mouthpiece for God? How does he speak today? Us. What are we here for as a church? Do we just show up as a social function and we get to visit and shoot the bull? It happens a lot of places, churches. They're just social gatherings. But you see, you understand, it's not the government's role to take care of the needy in this country. It's the church's. It's none of the government's business. The government is to protect us as, and, and keep us safe. All this government spending, folks, that's not how it was meant to be. That was never meant to, that's not what the government's role is. That's the church's role. The church is to feed the hungry. The church is to help the families that are downtrodden. It's the church's job. Why? Because we're an extension of who? Our Father. But you see, in order to do that, you've got to have faith. You ever been in a situation where you just didn't see no way out? You didn't see any answer? We're going somewhere with this this morning, church, so stay with me. And it's something that you didn't foresee happening, happened, and it got you, it, it helped you. So, faith is the substance of things we hope for. It's the evidence of things not seen. You know, I, and I'm going to, Billy, Billy Graham was the first one I heard say this, but it's so true. And I'm going to say the same thing. You could ask me questions in this Bible that I cannot answer. You can ask me things about this Bible I cannot explain to you. I could not. You can ask me questions that I can't answer. I don't understand everything. I don't understand why little children are abused. I don't understand why some people live a life and choose to stick needles in their arms. I don't understand why some little kids have everything and some little kids are, I, I, I can't explain that to you. I, why do some people die at an early age? I don't know. Why do some people go through horrendous pain while others never suffer a day? I don't know. I can't explain those things. But what I do know is that God is real. And that if you serve him, yes, you will still have pain. You will still have trials. But church, he will lead you through it all. And here's the best thing I can tell you today. If you get nothing else, get this. If you serve God, when what happens to us that is going to happen to all of us at some point or another, we will die. We will draw our last breath. You know, the youngest one in this room today is probably three or under. The oldest one in this room we're not going to talk about, but it's north of 40. <laughs> Every one of us, if the Lord tarries, we will draw our last breath. Some of us may die in a car wreck. Cancer may claim some of us. Diabetes may claim some of us. Heart attacks may get some of us. We, some of us may get shot. Some, there, so, there's no telling. I can't explain to you today. But let me tell you something. If you know God as your Savior, the very second you stop breathing down here, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're standing in heaven with Jesus Christ. And folks, that ought to excite you today. And that ought to make the flat tires of this world seem a little less important because we know where we're going. Amen? 
The world don't know where they're going. They have no idea about hell. And they are going full throttle. Folks, they're sitting in the car with it floorboarded toward hell. But I want to tell you something this morning. It's the evidence of things not seen. But let's back up for a minute. The substance of things hoped for. That ought to spark your mind to something you've heard before. Listen to Ro Romans 8, 24. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Let me ask you something. If you were living in this world and you didn't know Jesus Christ and you watched a Christian die of cancer and you had cancer too, could you see how they could question God? What's the first thing they're going to say? Well, I don't believe in God and I got cancer. They're claiming God and all these good things and they got cancer and they died too. Do you see how they think? You want to see where they see the difference? They see the difference in those six weeks they went to treatment and sat beside you. Because they have no hope. But you sat over there and you sang praises to God. And you had a smile on your face even though you were so, so sick. You know, and I, every time I think about something like this, I think of Sister Pam Proctor. She'd sing praises down there. And she'd sing. She could sing. And folks... Guess what? She died of cancer. And she is a Christian. You say, so the world says, how, how, where's your God in that? If they could only seen Sister Pam one second after she quit breathing, they'd see where our God is. And folks, you can't, there's a lot of things about God I can't explain. There's a lot of things about God you can't explain. But there's one thing I can promise you. If you will serve him, and trust him and have faith in him, all things will work together for your good. I'm not saying you'll like it. I'm saying that in the end, it'll work out for your good. So, you must know or have faith that we have a better home waiting. How many of you this morning know that heaven, this what we're living today, will not even compare to heaven? Amen. You know, I can, I, I've told you this illustration before many, many times, but I, I can remember being young, and even as I grew up, or when we, when we first got married, and I'd have to work like a week at a time, and I didn't, I, I remember one particular week I stayed out till like Thursday night before I got to come home. I can still remember topping that hill in front of Brother Larry Don's and seeing that light on at that old rock house, and I knew I was home. And folks, there's a lot of good there's just a feeling that comes over you when you can see the lights of home when you've been gone for a long time. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That is going to pale in comparison to when I draw my last breath and I see Jesus Christ waiting on me in heaven. We're not going to be able to... I can't explain it with, with words to how good it's going to be. We're going to see loved ones who's went on before. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, we know them. Amen, you'll know them. You'll know them beyond a shadow of a doubt. My grandma and grandpa will be there waiting on me. But first, I get to see Jesus. I get to see the one who bled and died on that cross and made it possible because my faith that I'm standing on today, my faith, you know, the world will tell me that you've never seen God. God doesn't exist. The world is it created from a big explosion. Yeah, and you know what started that big explosion? The words out of God's mouth said, let there be light. And there was, church. But because of my faith, nothing because of what I've done or because of who I am, but because of what he done and because of what, who he is, I get to go to heaven because I accepted that. I realized I'm a sinner. Folks, that's all I am, and that's all you are. I hate to bust your bubble this morning, but we're sinners. We come short of the glory of God. But because he loved us, my faith tells me, and he tells me, and I'm fixing to share another verse with you, it's impossible to get to heaven without faith. You cannot do it. 
regardless of what Dr. Oz or Oprah tells you on Channel 7, you, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And it's through his blood. And it's through his redemption. We're going to talk about the blood tonight. I, oh, I hope you come back because I, I want to get started there too. But folks, you've got to have faith. Now, how do you know if you have faith in God? <laughs> Let me go back to verse 6, Hebrews eleven six. 6. So it, this is not my opinion. Listen to what he says. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, okay, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How many, don't answer me this morning, but how many of you are diligent, diligently seeking God today? Can I ask you a couple of questions? And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to help you. Did you read your Bible today? Do you read it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Do you read your word every day? Do you pray every day? If you don't, hear me this morning, you are not diligently seeking God. That's just a fact. You know, this world we live in today, it does not deal well with truth, if you hadn't noticed. Nobody likes to hear the truth. The truth is, if we're diligently seeking God, we'll read his word more than we do the paper. We'll read his word more than we read anything else. We'll pray more than we yak our mouth about gossip down wherever we go to gossip. We'll, we'll bless people more. We'll lift people up more. Our thoughts will be about God. The book of Philippians tells us to think about the things that are good in this, to think about things that are pure, holy. Focus on those things. What does the evening news want us focusing on? The bad things. Ha have you noticed now they're wanting to draw more viewers, so at the end of every newscast, they have what? A feel-good story. Do you think 30 minutes, they could come up with more than one feel-good story? And how many of those feel-good stories do you hear the name Jesus Christ mentioned? Folks, there's going to be a lot of people feeling good right up till they get to hell. Because there's only one way to heaven, and it's a straight and narrow way. And it says few be there that find it. But how's it described the way to hell? Wide, easy. You can roll practically. But you, you know, we've got to have faith this morning to know that we have something more waiting. But are we diligently seeking? Would you say this morning you can have a measure of faith in people? I hope so. How many of you have faith in the people around you? Amen. I hope at least three of you may have some faith in your pastor. And you can ask my family. That faith would dwindle if you come and work cows with us. <laughs> you might see your pastor has a temper. But you know what? God's working on me. Praise God. And I, I have found if I will stop and pray before I start something, he helps me. And he'll help you too. Because folks ain't in one of us in here. It's perfect. I wish we were, but we're not. But we're, 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 we're working toward it. But you've heard of these pastors making horrible decisions and having to step down and leave their church, right? What does that do? People automatically, what, lose faith in him. But, but what does the outside world lose faith in? Church in a whole, right? Because they, they group everybody into one. They group you into that. But you see, we can have a measure of faith. And you notice I say measure. In people or things. How many of you walk out every morning and when you get in your car, you have faith that it's going to start? And some of you probably had a car every now and then you had to stop and pray for before you cranked it. But you see, those things that you have a measure in faith, and there's a reason why you have a measure of faith. Because they can fail you. Amen. Did you realize everybody sitting in this room, we can fail each other? Plain and simple. We can have a bad day. We can make bad decisions. We can let something come over us and we can make, we can fail. Read our sign out front. 
Try God. He never fails. I hope you see that's why you can have more than a measure of faith in God. From the time this book started till it ended, till it, whenever it, he comes back to get us, God will never fail. He has never failed and he will never fail. So you can have all your faith in him, more than a measure. But you see, I'll pick up the speed, but a person of true faith in God will not be moved by the things of this world. I'm going to say that again because some of you still watch the evening news and some of you still get depressed and upset. A person of true faith in God will not be moved by the things of this world. Folks, they can do whatever they want to us. We will stand as long as we hold God's hand. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 tells us. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's the only way he's going to be in their church, by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love. I tell you all the time, if you're a Christian, your life should not look like this. It should not be up, down, up, down, up, down. A Christian should be just like this, no matter what hits them. Never too high, never too low, because you know God's in control and God has the situation. And you also know Romans 8, 28. If you're a child of God, you know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. You may not like it while you're going through it, but hold on, God's doing something and it's going to be for your good. And this is the best example I can show you about our faith wavering. Can I, and I'm going to be real honest with you, and I'm going to use me as an example because I know me better than I know anybody else. And I'm sure some of you are like me. Sometimes when certain things happen, your faith seems to drop just a little bit. And you start looking at the world. Think about Peter. And I want you, from, from this day forward, when bad things happen to us or things aren't going the way we should and, th and things are piling on, I want you to remember Peter. And that, and that day he climbed out of that boat. And I've asked you this before, but with an amen, do you really believe truly in your heart that Peter walked on top of the water? Amen. amen. I do too. But... You tell me, who was he looking at while he was doing it? Jesus Christ. Huh. Folks, I've noticed, as I grow older and I grow closer to God, I sink less. Please hear me. I still sink. I'm not going to lie to you. I still have times when my faith may fail me a little bit. But what I've noticed is when I was younger, and my family will understand this, my fear of water, I would sink up to just where I could almost not breathe. I would almost give up on God when I was younger. I would get up here where you have to hold your head up to struggle to breathe. you know. And I would fight with everything in me to argue with God. But what I have found, the older I get and the more times I've seen him deliver me, I've seen him deliver my family, now I've seen him deliver my church family. And I see him time and time and time again like the sign says, try God, he will not fail. I, what I've noticed is now when I take my eyes off Jesus and I start to sink, I don't get as deep as I used to. Maybe now I only get about waist deep and I'm like, God, yes, I turn my, my vision back to God. So what I'm going to tell you today is I know if we all live to be 130, there will be days when we still sink a little. Because our faith will be tested. We're not perfect, but we can. But here's what I want us. I want us to get shallower and shallower and shallower before we realize that we need to turn back to Jesus Christ. We don't need to go completely under. But listen, I got great news for you this morning. You may say, well, Pastor, I have went completely under. I have turned from God. I have walked away from God. I am drowning. Well, listen to me today. All you got to do is extend your hand and you will see the face of Jesus Christ and his hand will come through the water and put you back where you belong. And, and we don't deserve that. But we're blessed with that. Amen? So what my prayer for you is starting today that when our ankles get wet, we'll turn back to God. I hope we don't ever have to go and then our pinky toe 
when it gets wet. I hope we turn back to God. And I hope you realize what I'm talking about is everyday problems, life problems. Maybe the doctor's told you something. Maybe you've got bills coming in that you don't know how you're going to make it. Folks, let me tell you something. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's how you make it. Trust him. There is no reason to doubt our Father. I've read this book several times from the opening cover to the end. There is absolutely no reason to doubt our Father or to fear this world. Our faith in him will always be rewarded. And I want to close with a very familiar scripture out of Deuteronomy that I want it to be your life verse. I want you to hang on to this verse. Deuteronomy 31 and 6. And I know there's children that can quote this. And I know, folks, but listen to what it says. Be strong. Don't be weak. Don't be wimpy. Don't, let's not have pity parties. We are a child of God. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something, church. I equate it to this. I can remember climbing on a school bus when I was in kindergarten or first grade. I had no fear because I had my brother behind me. And I knew that by the time whoever it was whooped him, I'd have time to get off the bus and get gone. So I didn't care to challenge anybody. You can ask him. I would sign him up. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. Any one of you can climb on the school bus of life and know that your father is right behind you. Don't fear this world. Don't fear what they can do to you. You don't, you're not, God does not want you to have a spirit of fear. Our God, but listen, that only applies to you today is if you've made him the Lord of your life. If you have not, then you need to be afraid up until the second you give your heart and soul to God. If you would, stand with me all over this building. I'm going to ask you that every head be bowed and every eye be closed. This is a very, very personal time this morning. And I want to ask you this morning, if you drew your last breath right now, do you know, do you have faith, and do you believe that if you drew your last breath today, that you will, your next step will be in heaven with Jesus Christ? If, that, if you don't know that this morning, that promise is right here waiting for you. If you step out and come to this altar and give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, friend, let me tell you something. He forgives you of your sins. He wipes them away with the very blood that he shed for you. A lot of people tell you the cross is most important. No, it was the blood that he spilled is the most important. That blood is the answer to all. If you've not applied that blood to your life, if you've not turned and given your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, then, friend, today is the day of salvation. Today you can have your names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life where no man can erase it. If you don't have that assurance today, please hear me. You have no assurance of getting home today alive. If you want peace, if you want to lay down at night with peace in your mind and in your heart, Give it all to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you're already a child of God. And maybe you were walking to Jesus, but maybe something in your life has taken your eyes off of Jesus. And maybe you feel yourself going in the water. Maybe you're only knee deep right now. Or maybe you're waist deep. Maybe you're, maybe you're chest deep. Or maybe you're underwater. I don't care where you're at this morning. Jesus Christ will lift you up. Maybe you're praying for answers and you just need reassurance. Whatever it is this morning, God wants you to know he cares about every aspect of your life. He loves you. He's going to guide you. He will direct you. And if you will just trust him and believe in him, he will work all things for your good this morning. If you need anything this morning from God, this altar's open and we'll gather together and pray.
Because, folks, there is power in prayer. Don't leave here wounded. Don't leave here weak. Don't leave here scared. If any of that's an issue in your life about anything this morning, come and lay it at the feet of Jesus Christ, and he'll carry it for you.